Hello everyone, my name is Christoph Felger from David Chipperfield Architects in Berlin. I have been collaborating with the office for more than 23 years now and I'm one of the responsible partners and design directors in the Berlin office. Also responsible for the Elb Tower project in Hamburg, which I'm going to talk about today um, within the series of the Architectural Foundation's uh, Hamburg topic. <clears throat> Before I jump into explaining our ideas and approaches, let me start with some thoughts on Hamburg that I believe are important to, um, as a background for understanding our position, our attitude towards the city and also the task. As a free and Hanseatic city, Hamburg has developed a very special ability over the centuries, namely to combine the free with the connected. In other words, one could also say Hamburg has learned how to cope with the duality of independence and dependence. As a member of the Hanseatic League, the city had to abide by rules and obligations on one hand, and um, that um, which could be also understood, you know, as a, as the opposite of freedom. On the other hand, Hamburg um, always maintained this concept of the free, um, which is fundamentally embedded already in the city's name, the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg, that's how it's called. So in our opinion, Hamburg has um, managed to, <clears throat> to integrate this duality also in a larger idea of the city and societal development, which is consequently in our view also reflected in the urban fabric and architecture of Hamburg. In the urban landscape, the normal and the sublime are in a lively interrelationship with each other and across and cross fertilize each other in a in a unique way, we believe in Hamburg. Landmarks like the spiral of this famous uh, historic St. Michael Church in Hamburg, which is probably one of the most his, his, uh, well known historic landmarks in Hamburg, um, defining famous uh, city silhouette um, um, has a very, it's not only a form and a symbol, but it's actually accessible. And, I, and these landmarks, in our view, are always anchored in many ways through form, obviously, materiality, content, also how they are made. The craftsmanship in Hamburg is very, very high quality. But above all, <clears throat> These landmarks are always defined through a public use. As you can see here, that the spiral of the church is also accessible. And this publicness provides moments of incomparable grace and grandeur. And this is perhaps the most typical Hanseatic quality we associate with Hamburg. And you can go on. I mean, there are many, many amazing projects like Chile House. I think everyone knows this by Fritz Hilger from the 1920s this beautiful brick expressionist building, which arrived like a stone ship in the center of the city. Um, but it's not only a building for the people who go inside, it's actually in the base, there's plinth, it's permeable, it's publicly accessible. And, um, and I mean, as I said, I could go on with endless other buildings, but I make it short, but have to show obviously the Alp Philharmonie by Herzog de Meuron another ship-like object that arrived like a UFO um, on top of this beautiful former key warehouse by Werner Kallmorgen. And undoubtedly the Elb Philharmonie is one of um, the most impressive, most impressive recent landmark buildings in Hamburg. And already by its use, it's public, but even if you don't intend to be at a concert or buy a ticket, you can actually go up and have this incredible terrace, public terrace, which is dividing the new part and the key, the existing key warehouse, 
which is accessible to everyone. <clears throat> so it continues that idea, that concept of accessibility for, for everyone. <clears throat> This understanding, or, or for us, a key to understanding the city lies precisely in this duality, in the, in the ability to combine the extraordinary with the ordinary. This is what we believe makes Hamburg such a unique city. And this understanding also includes a link link, perhaps even the knowledge that on a metaphysical level, everything becomes one or finds together, finds its place. That is the intellectual and cultural background, if I may put it that way, for our thoughts on the Elb Tower project. The Elb Tower is part of an impressive urban development Hamburg was, is undertake, still undertaking and which started more than 20 years ago, the Hafen City. At one point, and maybe it still is, Europe's largest urban redevelopment and renewal projects. The Hafen City Master Plan, we believe further balanced and renegotiated the city's abilities I just described <clears throat> and capacities to create a contemporary modern um, quarter. And in this new part of town, the Elb Tower occupies one of three sites identified by the master plan to create something special there. So to the north, you have this, uh, in the meanwhile, the um, existing Spiegel, medium high-rise building. It was meant to signify the northern entrance point right next to the historic city fabric. In the west you have the Elb Philharmonie, which I just showed, and to the east, very east, um, there's meant to be another important building which is called the Elb Tower. So, um, so the landmarks three were to be created at these locations, buildings that literally mark the land of the Hafen city and contribute to orientation, but also to a sense of belonging, we believe, in this new part of town. The Elb Tower competition called <coughs> explicitly for a landmark building with a lighthouse effect. And when you design a building like the Elb Tower in the Hafen city, you can't avoid dealing with the Elf Philharmonie. It's inevitably a challenge at this location, but also an inspiration. Like all Hamburg landmarks, I may add as well, the Elb Tower should be a self-confident, independent building, yet that also complements both the Hafen City and the Elb Philharmonie, Elb Philharmonie, but in no way it should compete with them or even turn its back on them like so many self-referential high-rise buildings. And perhaps in, it is the ancient Greek meaning of philharmonic, composed of the two words philos and harmonia, which translates as friends of harmony, that has made the Elb Philharmonia our inspiration for the Elb Tower within the context of what I've just said about, about Hamburg. Our Elb Tower is certainly the missing link for an overarching urban harmony that Hamburg aspires to. Let me now focus on three aspects that form the intellectual foundation for the Elb Tower design, the significance of form, the plinth, and the facade. Let me start also with this photo of a sketch. Actually, that was the first thing we did in the competition. I know that the first sketch in architecture is always a myth and in times of fake news, such a first sketch probably has an even harder time as far as, as its truth is concerned. But regardless of that, you have to believe me when I tell you that this sketch was there first, long before we started looking and studying the organization of the building, its public role and meaning, and obviously also all the other things, the facade and what comes along. The sketch was made on our way to Hamburg. We were sitting in the train with the team discussing intensively about how we wanted to approach the project. Also, whether we should at all participate at the project is we were not quite sure whether high rise buildings in Hamburg should be built, especially at this location. Eventually we participated and um, this formal approach 
um, I think was not so easy to us um, because usually we don't work like this. Now, um, even though I think the sketch illustrates best our intention, namely to find a shape for Hamburg's tallest building that would help the Elbe Tower to become an independent, but at the same time, integral part of the Hafen city and the city of Hamburg as a whole. And as I said, this, this formal approach was quite difficult for us. We have a rule in the office. And in fact, we are not interested in form and obviously that's a, a dangerous statement to make architects, especially from the office of the architects. But it's really true. Form at the beginning of our design processes are not so important. For us, form is the result and the consequence of many previous considerations iterations, etc. And starting the design process with the idea for a form was a novelty to us. The strong formal urban gesture, as the sketch indicates, of the concave shaped place is the tall building of the Elbe Tower in a spatial relationship in our view with its surrounding urban landscape, and also in a dialogue with the Elbe Philharmonie. As an abstracted counter movement to the roof of the Elbe Philharmonie, the form conveys the height of the Elbe Tower, either the form conveys the height of the Elbe Tower down into the city. And depending on how you approach it, the Elbe Tower either leans towards the city or the city crows above itself into the sky along the form of the Elbe Tower. Both views are based on the idea of moving towards each other, the city and the tower, or being in a relationship with each other. This basic attitude of establishing a strong relationship with each other has accompanied our work from the very beginning. But of course, as critical architects, um, this first intuitive idea had to be examined. It had to prove itself in the design process. And as you can see from these model photos, working models, we started looking at the volume and mass of the building from different angles to finally clarify the position of the high building on the northern boundary of the site so that the lower parts of the building to the south would not be overshad overshadowed. <clears throat> and in the end, however, that first sketch never left our minds. And as you can see, it has kept creeping into our design process and survived eventually as the most convincing idea. Nevertheless, it took us a, a lot of a time to understand the form in relation to its mass and the impact of that, the use of space, also its elegance, and obviously the impact it has on the neighborhood, as well as its ambiguity between object and a building that mediates between itself and the city. And I'm just running through another few um, photos of trying to give you an impression of, of that of that process and obviously then it's being refined optimized um, using workflow of parametric design and, and so on and also cl clarifying you know the structure in the most efficient way for a building form one could argue is not necessarily very efficient So it is the form, the strong urban gesture with which we unite the free, the independent and the autonomous nature of the Elbe Tower with its dependent connecting and mediating capabilities. You see, I think one can see quite nicely in these images and how they relate and, and somehow speak, speak to each other, the Elbe Tower, especially in the Elbe Philharmonie. Another very important aspect was the creation of a plinth. And the question of how does the high rise building arrive at street level, at ground level? We all know that high rise buildings are pri primarily there to influence and to enhance the city's silhouette. And they can enrich it and very much determine it, so to speak great identity and the character of the city. On the other hand, we also know that the effects from close up, especially at street level, is generally different 
and much more difficult. One could even argue that high-rise buildings are anti-urban species. At street level, they usually contribute little or nothing, especially as freestanding buildings to the quality of the immediate urban space. Since the ground floor brings together a lot of functions that clash with public quality, such as escape routes, staircases, delivery, waste disposal zones, car park entrances, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. large lobby halls, which today are more or less um, security areas. And as a rule, very few coherent areas remain in high rise buildings at ground floor le level that can accommodate effective public functions. However, we believe that every building, especially of that scale, of that importance, of that visual importance in the city, does have to take up a public responsibility. It has to provide an idea of how it connects on the ground and also how it enriches and adds something to the immediate urban environment. For the Ape Tower, we made use of the site geometry, quite a vast site, and also its topography, and proposed, in fact, a kind of plinth that spans the extensive site and takes on various tasks to welcome the building on street level. The plinth integrates all these ancillary functions I've just talked about, but it also mediates the different existing height level um, on the basis of the existing topography, the ramps, terraces, lifts, and in our case, also a series of public terraces. It also allows for the creation, as you can see in this sketch, of large coherent areas for effective public functions, and it provides the potential for a high degree of permeability, we believe. So the plinth thus forms, in our opinion, the public foundation for the Air Tower. And these are just some diagrams I run through. So there would be entrances on all sides of the building and they do have a meaning. So they connect the public transport, but also the uh, a new boat landing place on the northern side of the building. There will be people walking and um, coming by, by bike. That's all accessible and, um, and, and being um, provided for within the building. So that there is this idea of really connecting to these um, conditions. Uh, and as you can see here quite nicely, that this blinds creates being eventually also part of the high rise, but it creates its own life and is the mediating spatial element between the immediate urban surrounding and its neighborhood. And I briefly run through to the program. So um, the, in fact, um, I didn't mention it. It's an, it was an investor-led competition in a, a kind of close, in close collaboration with the city. So we had a lot of workshops and discussions with city officials and many other um, consultants involved. And the city wants to play an important part and control also part of, especially the public quality of the project. So the, the, the plinth, there is a demand of public function. This is heavily being debated what exactly it is. The spaces we provide for now could range from a museum, educational facilities, even a small theater or cinema. But this is still um, under discussion. There will be a hotel and boarding house in the plinth area as well. So um, publicly accessible fitness, wellness and spa area, the co-working which eventually is the transition zone towards what the, the biggest use will be, the offices. And on the very top, like I mentioned already in the other important landmark buildings in Hamburg, there will be a publicly accessible bar, restaurant, and terrace from which everyone can enjoy, I think, this future quite unique view over Hamburg. And within, Oops, I think I went too fast. So I also will just briefly run through some of the current developments of, of, of floor plans. So here you see the ground floor, which maintains this, this, this three main entrances related to the public transport I just um, uh, explained. And everyone will enter through these entrances. There's no security zones. So you can just walk in and then you will enter into a daylit central hall from which 
everything else is then accessible. And it's, one could say it's a shared public space. And this is just the entrance between the new train station on the left and the plinth of the Elk Tower building a section where you can nicely see that we opened up the center to bring daylight and to create this shared atrium space. Also, the northern elevation here, which does catch northwestern elevation, I have to say, as it does catch a bit of evening sun. So we hope that opening up the plinth towards the water also will add something to a public quality of the project. And then I'm just running up. This is the hotel <clears throat> and the spa with publicly accessible terraces and just running up and you can see all sorts of differently sized office area. That was another wish by the client that there are many diverse floor plans to really offer all sorts of options and varieties for, for tenants. <clears throat> The last and third aspect I want to talk about is obviously the facade and the architectural expression and appearance of the building. In high-rise buildings, materiality usually plays a subordinate role. Facade elements, their details and the way they are made are hardly perceptible at height. High-rise buildings in out you realize on simple but strong conceptual decisions in which facades support the formal expression of the building. And another important aspect I briefly want to talk about is that over the past three decades, we have seen a multitude of high-rise buildings all over the world, and usually they're built in glass. And obviously there's a reason, glass promises transparency. And if you build a high building, Every client, every user obviously wants to enjoy this, this, the promise of a spe spectacular view. I think this is what high rise buildings are also about. Um, but the supposed transparency and lightness of fully glazed facades has long proven to be a fallacy, as you can see here in, in the image, I think, of Doha. On sunny days, buildings are um, buildings are usually dark and closed, the blinds go down. On rainy days or even gray days, they even look more darker and ponderous. But even on a sunny day, as you can see on the image, there's not much left of the initial promise of lightness and transparency. Glass glazed buildings are only transparent at night when the light is kept on. And we've also long since learned that fully glazed buildings are not sustainable either however much is, uh, this is still a dispute. <clears throat> and although the views from the Elbta will certainly become a trademark, we did not want to build a glass building. We have long been concerned in the office with the simplicity of facades based on the concept of the economy of means, one could say um, an interest in low tech elevations. We're interested and facades that effectively fulfill their purpose without having to resort to high-tech solutions, especially when they're exposed to harsh weather conditions, as it is the case in Hamburg, which is so close to the sea. So the wind, but also very cold wind, is the salt in the wind is a huge challenge for elevations in, in Hamburg. And as Hamburg's tallest building, we don't think the air tower should be a heavy building overshadowing the city. I think it should be something friendly, light, and truly transparent. So in designing the facade, we were concerned with establishing some contradictions, I have to admit. Um, light heaviness, floating grounding, and a closed openness really all contradictions we were interested to resolve. Our facade therefore consists of two layers. An inner layer, indicated here in red, I hope you can see the climatic envelope, and an outer layer, a skirt that essentially acts as a pre soleil to reduce the solar gain. At the same time, due to the shape of the vertical louvers, which maybe you can recognize in the lower part of this diagram, this drawing, the elliptical, 
The facade reflects daylight deep into the floor plan and diffuses daylight, while the inner layer takes up all the structural and climatic requirements and is produced as a fairly simple prefabricated facade with even some window openings. So I have to admit that the window openings are usually a, a, an amazing problem in high rise buildings because of the wind pressure on the building. But for the, the psychological um, factor for um, and, and a health idea within the working environment of the future offices here, you can actually open if you want the window a bit, but it's not really part of the overall um, MEP and, 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 and concept for, for, for ventilating um, the building, but at least we are offering this, this option in, in, the build, in the building. And um, so while this inner layer is really simply made, prefabricated um, and fulfills all the climatic functions, the outer layer um, is defined by the secondary task, which I just talked about, sun protection, daylight reflection and diffusion, but also maintenance. So we don't have big grains on top of the roof. You actually can access the building floor by floor on these maintenance walkways you can see here. And um, further on, we realized that I don't have the figures now, but there's a, a large group of people do actually fear height. And we realized that that is an issue in high rise buildings. So in addition to fulfilling you know, the sun protection, daylight reflection, this outer layer also provides a like psychological security. It gives you a sense of security when, when you walk up towards the facade from within. And as you can see here in this collage, it's quite nice how this layer gives you that sense of security. At the same time, it really is open, it's light, and it will enjoy these incredible views which the tower is promising. By fulfilling these tasks through a finely tuned system of white horizontal bars and white elliptical shaped vertical fins made of aluminium, the outer facade layer surprisingly develops these ambiguous qualities of lightness and heaviness, openness and closeness, immateriality and also materiality. The building is never quite one or the other, it's always all together. And depending on the viewer's point of perception and the time of day, the Elb Tower oscillates between a notion of what we define as seriousness and looseness, as well as um, austerity and playfulness, poles that we associate with Hamburg and the Anseatic virtues. So from these three areas of tension or areas of focus, the form, the base and the facade, the Elb Tower, in our view, develops its cityscape defining character, being an independent building, yet at the same time being a connected building, a mediating building, and it thus becomes the new landmark for the Hafen city, but also, we believe, for the entire city of Hamburg. Thank you very much. <laughs>